So time to start again. And uh, now I will do a little bit of uh, proving examples and then we'll go to some live coding. Live coding of proofs actually. Um, so here is um, an example where I'm trying to talk about proof by contradiction. So um, proof by contradiction is a tool, a classical tool of classical mathematics. Uh, you want to prove some property P. And um, what you do is you assume that P does not hold and you prove something not possible, so something impossible. For example, it's usually formulated that you prove Q and not Q. So given that we assume this, we can prove two mutually incompatible claims. And there is a free choice of this Q here. So as an example, uh, which I will go into on the next uh, page, uh, the claim P is not rational of R for, for a value that we'll look at more further on. So basically R is irrational. So the ir part of irrational here is not rational. So that's this not. And then we will use the assumption not P, which is then not not rational which is the same as saying that R is rational. So on the, on the next slide, we will use the proof rule in this form saying that if we assume that a certain number R is rational and we from that can prove both a property Q and a property not Q, which we will have to design the Q property later, then if we can prove both Q and not Q as consequences, then clearly this can't be true, which means R wasn't rational to start with. This claim that R is rational is then falsified. Uh, I'm writing up in the right corner here variants. So this Q and not Q, sometimes it's just written falsity or bottom. So uh, if not P implies something absurd, then P must hold. So remember again, this notation is this kind of um, logic where you have assumptions above and then a bar and then um, conclusions below. And uh, this implies something impossible that's sometimes also used as the implementation of not. So this rule can also be seen as not not P implies P. If it's false, that P is false, then P is true. So we, not not P implies P is the same as this, which is the same as this, just different ways of expressing it. Okay, let's move into a, a concrete application of this, namely proving one of the classical things from mathematics of for many, many years ago, actually the old Greeks uh, proved this, that the square root of two is irrational. So if you want to have in the back of our minds, uh, the first or the logic part that we talked about before the break, the domain here I pick as the positive real numbers. So why not all the real numbers? Uh, well, it's because I'm a little bit lazy. Um, the thing is that when, when you specify that something is a root, it's usually specified by saying that r squared is two. So if r squared is two, then r is the square root of two. But as you well, very well know, if we allow all real numbers, then there will be two solutions to these equations, plus square root two and minus the square root two. To avoid confusion here, I just want one solution. So therefore I arbitrarily restrict in this particular case, my first order logic to work only on positive or non-negative rational numbers, zero and up. Similarly, I mean, you know from, from the lecture like two weeks ago or one week ago that uh, 
I need to make some kind of domain restriction because also if I would have uh, used co uh, complex numbers, I might get even more solutions and so on. So depending on uh, what data type I'm using, I will get different number of solutions. What I could not use here is the rational numbers. So why is that? Well, because I want to prove that it's irrational and then I need to have irrational numbers within my domain. Otherwise it wouldn't be possible. Otherwise I would sort of uh, have to step outside of the domain to prove this. So I use a domain which includes all the numbers I need, which is in this case, the positive or non-negative rational numbers. Um, but um, so not too few and not too many. Okay, so let's see. How have I defined this? So first of all, I specify, instead of using the notation square root two, I just use this specification. And this just says equivalent to that if I want to say that R is equal to square root two, I can just as well say that R squared equals two, given the restriction to positive numbers. So this R will now be the notation for square root of two to make it a little shorter to read. Uh, I'd shorter to write mainly because I had to write the square root of two lots of times otherwise. Okay, then I defined a predicate, a a first order logic predicate R of one parameter X and its domain is R plus. So X is a value of R plus. And the claim which could hold for certain X's and not for others is that there exists a T. Notice here, I'm using a typed quantification so T being an, a whole number means that the subset of reals that T has to belong to. So T is a real number, but it has to actually not only be a real number, but as an, an integer. There has to exist such a T and there has to exist an N, which is a positive natural number. And here I mean not zero, so one and up. And then I want to say, these t and n are such that x multiplied by n equals t. So this may be a little bit roundabout way, but it's def defining what it means to be a rational number. So x could be any real number. Well, in the domain here, it's r plus. But if it satisfies this for some t and n, then x is actually of the form t divided by n. So x is actually already from this first part what we usually call a rational number. But I want to be a little more specific because it's a bit inconvenient in mathematics when you have lots of different choices. So notice that if X would be a third, for example, then we could have T equals one and N equals three. Then the third times three is one, but we could also have T equals two and N equals six or any other such pair. So you want the simplest combination of T and N. So we want to reduce all the common factors of T and N. So we add an extra restriction here. So not only should T and N uh, relate with TX in this way, but also we want to check that the greatest common divisor of T and N is one. So if they would be both be even, for example, then the greatest common divisor would be at least two. Okay, and let's, let's call this Q now for a start because that will simplify matters later. So remember what we needed to prove up here, the square root of two is irrational, which means that we want to prove that not R of not the, well, we replace this specific X with this R. Okay, and remember we want to use proof by contradiction. So we assume the opposite. We assume that R is actually rat rational. And now there will be the start of some writing. So you probably have seen this proof before, but it's still useful to, to try to carry it out. So from our assumption R of R, we know that there exists a T and an N with this property. So as we have an equality, we can also square it and get that T squared equals R squared times N squared. But we know 
by definition that r squared is 2. So t squared is equal to 2 times n squared. Or in other words, t squared is an even number. Now, if t squared is an even number, that also means that t must be an even number. We could have a small proof of that also using uh, this same kind of proof, because if you assume that t is odd, then t times t is also odd. So odd is not even, so that our t must be even. OK, so t is even. That means that there exists some k such that t equals 2 times k. That's another way of stating that t is even. But actually, I should probably be more specific to say there exists a z. This is a bit hard to fit in. OK, so there exists a natural number k, such as t equals 2k. Otherwise, the existing a real number is not much of a, uh, much of a help there. OK, so t is equal to 2k. Let's in introduce that. It means that 2 squared times t squared equals 2 times n squared. So I just inserted, no, not t, sorry, uh, k. I used this new equality, 2, time, two squared k squared is 2 times n squared, um, using this equality here. OK, and then divide both sides by 2. Then we get this means that 2 times k squared equals n squared. OK, we can use the same trick again. So the fact that 2 times k squared is n squared means that there exists an L Whoops, this is supposed to be an L, which is a natural, uh, which is an integer such that n equals 2 times L. And with the same reason as, reasoning as before, that means uh, that now we have this. Um, well, if we summarize what we got, we know that t is equal to 2 times k and n equals 2 times l. But then the GCD of t and n is the GCD of 2k and 2l which is at least two. And more importantly, it's definitely not equal to one. So we have actually concluded here that GCD of T and N is not one, but we also know it's equal to one. But it means here we have actually from the assumption that R is rational proved Q and not Q. And then by contradiction, it means that we've proved our assumption from the start. So this kind of reasoning is then using the properties uh, well, it's using both this property and this property and the definition of R from the beginning. And then it's using the proof rule saying that if we can prove any property Q and its negation, then we're done. And the property Q we happened to pick from the start was a good one because we could also disprove it down here. Okay, let's take another example. Um, first, the general rule. So there is proof by cases, which I mentioned uh, already on the previous lecture on Tuesday. Remember, we even implemented the or lim function for that. But the, the, the rule to remind us is if we can prove A or B, 
and that both A implies C and B implies C. So there are two possible cases of which we don't know which holds, but if both those uh, imply C, then C is true. Oh, and a special case, if B happens to be not A, then we know that, and we know that we have this uh, excluded middle, we, we know that either A or not A is true. That means that we can simplify this whole rule in a special case to this rule. So if somewhere we can prove that some claim A implies C and its opposite also implies the same C, then we have proved C. And as before, here we don't need to know which one of A and B is true. And also here, we don't need to know if it's A that it's true or not A. If we can prove this implication and this implication, then C has to hold, even if we don't know which case it started from. So let's see a use of this. I want to prove the red claim up on the right. So the claim is that there, there exist two irrational numbers, x and y, such that one to the power of the other is rational. So a priori, it's not obvious if this is true or not, but we will try to use this proof rule to prove it. And the first step in all of these things is to try to formulate more precisely what this text description actually means in logic. So I claim that this is the meaning. So there exists a P and there exists a Q. So I, it doesn't say and here, but the way that these quantifiers work, exists P, exists Q, means that there exists both a P and a Q. And then there are the, there's an and here between three different parts. The three parts being P is irrational, Q is irrational, and P to the power of Q is rational. So the domain here again is the domain of positive rational numbers, let's say. Okay, so if we want to start proving this, um, it's useful to, to also remember the exponentiation rule up here. So repeated exponentiation. So for example, two to the power of three, three to the power of two. If you take two to the power of three, that's three times, two, the th three multiplied, two multiplied three times, and then that's squared. Then that's two, two, two times two, two, two. So you can see that there's three times and three times. So that's in total two to the power of six which is two to the power of three times two. So the general rule is up there. And we will use that further on in the proof. Just this is a reminder, so you won't get surprised and try to think it out later. So let's see now, if we want to prove an existence, we should actually come up with some evidence. So this is always difficult. I mean, we, we don't know where to start. But um, let's start by just uh, saying on the previous slide uh, page, we, we def already proved that the square root of two is not rational. So this claim, not rational P, and this claim, not rational Q, can be made true by setting both P and Q to R. And then now I have this definition that r squared equals two. So uh, r is the square root of two. So if we use that to see where we get, then we can at least satisfy two of the three requirements. So this first requirement, the second requirement, but then we have to check, okay, is the third requirement true or not? And the third requirement, is that P to the power of Q should be rational. Well, we can insert P and Q as R. So it's R to the power of R or the square root of two to the power of the square root of two. Now, this does not immediately strike me as a rational number, but I also don't know 
a priori how to prove it. But now comes the proof rule, proof by cases in this specific case. So there are two cases here to check. So we don't know if this holds, so we don't know if this is rational or not, but we can at least know that either it is rational or it's irrational. So there are two cases to check. Okay, let's first assume case one. So this case is, um, yeah, well, it's, it's what it says up here. The, the case is in, in words that uh, R to the power of R is rational or P to the power of Q is rational. Well, have we proven C in this case? How do we know if we've proven C? Well, what does C contain? Well, just, we have to just pick a P and a Q. We've already done that. They are both R. We have to prove this, which we know from the previous page. We have to prove this, which we know from the previous page. And we've just assumed that this is true. And we're allowed to do that inside the left branch here. So it's not something which we claim is true in the mathematics. It's just something we need to check out here. Well, if we assume this is true, then, then we have all the three parts we need and the whole C is true. So this is trivial. Yes, trivial. So it's by definition. So if this happens to be a rational number, if the square root to the power of the square root of two happens to be rational, then we're done. Then we have proven the claim. Okay, but this doesn't help us because we don't know if it's a rational number. But if we can prove the opposite case as well, then we are done. So let's move to the opposite case. So everything on the slide is the same except the assumption down here. So now we assume that the square root of two to the power of the square root of two is irrational. So it either has to be rational or irrational. So, uh, sorry, I forgot to page over. So now it's the case then uh, where we try to assume we start from not A instead. So, okay, we know that now in this uh, special case, this value square root of two to the power of square root of two is an irrational number. Let's call it X. So, let x equal r to the power of r. OK, now we want to prove c. And remember, for c, we needed to show the existence of a p and a q, which were irrational. Before, we only had the square root of 2 to pick from, because we knew, knew that was irrational. Now we have two numbers. We have x as well. So let's let's try. Uh, so whoops, sorry. Uh, try p equals x and q equals r. So and see what happens. So if p is equal to x, then yes, we have assumed it to be rational. So we know the first part holds. And we know from two slides back that the square root of two is irrational. So we know that part holds. We only need to check this, p to the power of q. Okay, so let's compute here. What is p to the power of q? I, I'm sort of moving up to this line. So p to the power of q, that's actually x to the power of r. Very difficult to read here because we've chosen p equals x and q equals r just to see if it works. So x to the power of r is equal to r to the power of r to the power of r. Well, we know from this rule up here that we can simplify this expression to r to the power of r times r. Anyone seeing a simplification possibility here? Yeah, so first we can notice that the upper part here is equal to r square, which is equal to two. So this is the same as r square. And well, as r square is equal to two, this is equal to two. And is 
two a rational number? Well, yes. Two is a rational number because it can be written as two divided by one. So this means that we have now proven C, which was this whole claim. Both on the previous slide, we proved A implies C. That was case one. And now we've proven not A implies C. And using this proof rule, proof by cases, we've actually proven C. So we're done. QE, whoops, QED. So notice that we don't know yet if the square, if X is rational or not, but we don't need to know because there are two possibilities. Either it is rational, in which case P and Q can both be R, or it's irrational, in which case P can be X and Q can be, can be R. And in both cases, we showed that P to the power of Q with different choices of P and Q, but in both cases, it will be a rational number. Okay, this was the last of the sort of Jamboard slides. So now we'll uh, move over to some uh, Haskell and then I will stop and start the recording as usual.